Hi guys. So I said I would let you discuss, and I have let you discuss. But I love these poems so much. I think I'm just going to talk about them. Um, so the first one, what is the point of the 13 ways of looking at a blackbird? Let's look at this poem. Number one, among 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. Uh, one of your classmates mentioned to me that this poem starts from stasis, no movement. The only thing moving is the eye of the blackbird. So already we have an emphasis on looking, right? It's in the title, looking. Here it's the eye. Second one, I was of three minds, which means I couldn't make up my mind. Like a tree in which there are three blackbirds. And it's true, blackbirds can be noisy. So here we're making a connection between the birds talking to each other just like one person can't decide. They have three different ideas. So we're making a connection between looking and thinking. Third one, the blackbird whirled in the autumn winds. It was a small part of the pantomime. A pantomime is a dumb show. It's a performance without sound. What do we call that in Chinese? There we go. OK, yeah, so it's saying that the bird flying in the wind, this natural imagery is just a show. In other words, it's just a surface appearance. A show is what you see, but the important part is what does it mean? So nature is like a show. It's there for you to see, but what does it mean? Fourth one. A man and a woman are one. A man and a woman and a blackbird are one. So, OK, here we have opposites, right? Man and woman. And we can see how they might fit together like a yin and yang, right? Yin yang shang he. But then you have a blackbird. Doesn't seem to fit the original picture. It seems to expand the original picture. Now, not only man and woman, but also humans and animals. So this seems to be telling us to think more broadly, to be more inclusive, not to accidentally exclude things that we should be thinking about. Five, I do not know which to prefer. The beauty of inflections, Inflection is how you say something. Or the beauty of innuendos. Innuendo is how you imply something. So inflection is to say it. Innuendo is not to say it. The blackbird whistling or just after. Here it's making a connection, right? The blackbird whistling is just like somebody talking. After the blackbird finishes whistling is like somebody suggesting something without talking. At this point, I should tell you that the blackbird is famous for its song. The blackbird song is famously beautiful. There have been classical musicians who have written uh, musical works based on the blackbird uh, singing. So it's not just any bird. That, that is talking about whistling. The blackbird's whistling is already re quite remarkable. But what about just after it's finished? After the blackbird is finished whistling, what is left? What do we have? The feathers, yes, but we also have the memory of the music. We have the impact that it has on us. While it's singing we enjoy it but after it's finished singing we remember it and we focus on the parts that we love the most just like listening to somebody talk as i'm talking you're trying to grab my meaning but after i finish and everything is quiet then you start to think about what i just said
politics. Icicles filled the long window with barbaric glass. The shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro. The mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause, which means it's unexplainable. So this stanza seems to be pure imagery, right? Icicles like glass, blackbird back and forth. But then it says that it is a cause. A cause always has an effect. So if this is the effect, if the mood, the atmosphere is the effect, we can't really explain how this mood was created. Yes, it's cold. Yes, there's a blackbird. But why does that create this kind of mood? So this stanza seems to be saying that not everything can be explained through cause and effect. And if you're taking my writing class, I apologize because our current unit is cause and effect essays. But some things cannot be explained. Number seven, oh, thin men of Haddam, why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the women about you? OK, this is a very dense stanza. Many different things happening here. First of all, Haddam, city in Connecticut. It exists today, but it sounds like an ancient city. The name re resembles an ancient city. So it's giving the idea of something timeless, something ancient. Golden birds, like an ideal bird, right? Something perfect and impossible. So why do you imagine something impossible when the blackbird is right here? Notice that the blackbird in this stanza is not flying. It is walking just like a person in our world, in our society. And it's walking around the women, right? So it begins with men, ends with women. Again, the yin and the yang. But also often men are thought of as chasing women. So here we have a connection between women as the object of desire and the perfect golden bird as a symbol of desire or something else that you might want to chase like money or fame. So in fact, this stanza is saying, why are you so focused on that impossible goal when you have a perfectly good blackbird right around you? Next page, number eight. I know noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms. So these rhythms are clear and impossible to ignore. But I know too that the blackbird is involved in what I know. So when I think about the way people talk, the high noble way that people talk, when I think about the rhythm of their speech, I also know that it is not limited to the person talking. It is not limited to people only. The blackbird is always here. If we think of the blackbird as a symbol of nature, this might be easier to understand. Always nature is in the background. Sometimes it's in the foreground, but it's always in the background. Everything you do, the blackbird is there. Kind of scary. And so here it's emphasizing the thing that you're doing is to know your pursuit of knowledge, what you want to seek and find out. The blackbird will always be part of the answer. There will always be something in the background that unites everything that you seek. Right, the man and the woman and the blackbird are one. Everything is united. Number nine, when the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. Oh God, that's beautiful. OK, so in this one, we don't actually see a blackbird anymore. In the previous eight stanzas, there was always a blackbird. It just said it's in the background. But here, when the blackbird is gone, we can only think of the blackbird. 
this is an example of the blackbird always being there even when it's not there. So that's why it marked the edge of one of many circles. When the blackbird is outside of the circle, then you suddenly realize, hey, it's a circle. There's a limit. There's an edge. And it's not just one circle. It's one of many circles, because when this example makes sense to you, then you start to see this happening in many different places. In any situation, when you realize something is not here, then is when you see the edge of the situation. So in fact, this poem, as we said at the very beginning, this poem is about looking and thinking. 10. At the sight of blackbirds flying in a green light, even the bods of euphony would cry out sharply. So even those who sing beautiful songs, when they see a blackbird flying in a green light, would cry out. Sharply here would be less melodious, less harmonious, more like strange sounds. So even when everything seems to be going well, even when things seem beautiful, the sudden emergence of a blackbird can turn everything around, can change the whole situation. 11. He rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. A coach is a horse-drawn carriage, Mata. Once, a fear pierced him, so he was suddenly very scared, in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. He thought that the shadow of his uh, baggage and luggage was blackbirds. So this is the same thing as the previous stanza, except number 10 is about an actual situation. Number 11 is about a situation in the mind. Number 12, the river is moving. The blackbird must be flying. Natural imagery. When the river is moving and nature follows its course, then the blackbird must also be doing its own thing. Again, we don't see a blackbird, right? It must be flying. We don't actually know. And yet, because we know the uh, patterns of nature, we can safely assume that the blackbird will also be following its natural course. The nature here is a result of our thinking about nature. It is not a result of our observing nature. And finally, number 13, it was evening all afternoon. Oh, what a brilliant line. All afternoon it was evening. So uh, there are many ways to think about this. Let's continue. It was snowing and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limbs. A cedar is a kind of tree. So the blackbird is sitting in the tree. So all evening, it was, sorry, it was evening all afternoon. So all afternoon it was dark, it looked like there was no sun, and it was snowing, and it was going to snow, which means it was going to keep on snowing. And all through the snow, the blackbird sits there in the tree. What is it doing in the tree? It's looking. The eye of the blackbird. So the poem ends where it begins. 13 ways of looking at a blackbird is also using the blackbird as an example of looking. The one thing connecting all of these poems is the blackbird. It's either the main example or an absent example or what we call a provocation to thought. Something that makes you think or makes you rethink. So what is this poem trying to tell us? What is the point of this poem? At least to me, I think the po point of this poem is that think, uh, looking cannot be divorced from thinking. Whenever you look, you must be thinking about what you see. And so different ways of thinking will give you different images. 
thinking is an is an action of the mind. And the poem uses a blackbird to give us many different examples of this. Stevens was a very philosophical poet. And we can see this more in the second poem, the idea of order at Key West. So very quickly, this poem is about uh, the speaker goes to Key West, sees a woman on the shore singing. So let's look at this one. She sang beyond the genius of the sea. Genius does not just mean a smart person. Genius at this time meant intellect, thinking. So her singing was beyond what the sea could think. It was beyond what the sea could understand. The water never formed to mind or voice. It's the same idea. The water does not have a mind. The water could not speak. Like a body, holy body, it was only a body, does not have a mind. Fluttering its empty sleeves, so the water is empty. And yet its mimic motion made constant cry, caused constantly a cry that was not ours, although we understood inhuman of the veritable ocean. So when the when the sea is making a motion that follows nature, that follows humanity, it always repeats and gives off the sound. A cry is like a shout. So made constant cry is the sound of the sea coming back and forth constantly. A cry. Made constant cry. OK, so this is the sound of the sea. Caused constantly a cry is the woman singing to the sea. The sea is causing her to sing. She's singing at the sea. This is the mimic motion. And these cries, these sounds were not ours, right? We are not the sea. The sea is not us. This is, this is the sound of the sea, not our sound. Although we understood in human of the veritable ocean, even though it's not our sound, we understood what it meant. Veritable just means truly. It's for emphasis. The sea was not a mask. No more was she. So neither of them are have a, having a false appearance. They are what they are. The song and water were not medleyed sound. Even if she sang, uh, sorry, even if what she sang was what she heard. So her song and the water, these two sounds did not fit together. A medley is a combination of songs. So these two did not fit together, even if she was singing what she heard, right? Her singing is mimicking the ocean, and yet they don't fit together. Since what she sang was uttered word by word. The reason these two don't fit together is because the woman singing uses language. And as we said in the first stanza, the sea does not have a voice. It may be that in all her phrases stirred the grinding water and the gasping wind. So it's possible that in her song was the sound of the ocean. But it was she and not the sea we heard. So up to this point, the story is she's by the ocean. She's singing. She is singing inspired by the ocean. But what she sings is more than the ocean. And so even if she's singing because of the ocean, we hear her voice and not the sound of the ocean. They are linked, but they are different. For she was the maker of the song she sang. The ever hooded, tragic gestured sea was merely a place by which she walked to sing. So the song came from her, even though she was inspired, even if she is inspired by the sea, it is her song. The sea is just a place. Whose spirit is this, we said, because we knew it was the spirit that we sought. This is the spirit that we want and knew that we should ask this often 
as she sang. It's such a beautiful song. We want to understand it. Where does it come from? That's why we keep asking. If it was only the dark voice of the sea that rose, or even colored by many waves, if it was only the outer voice of sky and cloud of the sunken coral water walled, coral is like uh, the, the animals that grow on the seafloor, however clear, it would have been deep air, the heaving speech of air, a summer sound repeated in a summer without end and sound alone. So if it really did come from the sea, if it really did come from nature, then it would be a repeated sound year after year, and it would only be sound, nothing more. But it was more than that, more even than her voice and ours, our voice, among the meaningless plungings of water and the wind, theatrical distances. So like in this environment, such a huge sea, such a huge sky, these distances are very theatrical. Bronze shadows, bronze means like gold and yellow. Bronze shadows heaped on high horizons. So this is uh, the sunset or the sunrise. Describing the color of the sky. Mountainous atmospheres of sky and sea. So it's not just nature, but it's not just her voice. It's not just our voice talking about her song. It's all of it together. It was her voice that made the sky acutest at its vanishing. Ah, acute means sharp, like an angle. And it's vanishing. So where does the sky vanish? The sky vanishes on the horizon, deeping Shin. So her voice focused our attention on that horizon. She measured to the hour its solitude. Her voice made us feel alone in nature at that very moment. She was the single artificer of the world in which she sang. Artificer just means creator. So she was the only creator of the world brought about by her song. And when she sang, the sea, whatever self it had, became the self that was her song, for she was the maker. Then we, as we beheld her, so as we looked at her, striding there alone, walking there by the sea. We knew that there never was a world for her except the one she sang and singing made. So this is telling us that a woman by the sea singing because of the sea is not determined by the sea, is not determined by the viewers. She creates her own world out of everything in this environment. And in fact, this is the only world in which she belongs as she is singing. When she stops singing, the world changes. Again, we have an example of perception, observation, being connected with thinking. This is the only world that exists when she sings. Let's take a short break.
page five. Ramon Fernandez, tell me if you know. This is a fun fact about this poem. So according to the footnote, there is a guy named Ramon Fernandez. But when Stevens was writing this poem, he didn't know. He just chose a name that sounded it would fit. It's a random name. Florida, before it became part of the US, was a Spanish colony. And so that's why it's a Spanish name. So this dude, tell me if you know why when the singing ended and we turned toward the town. Tell why the glassy lights, the lights in the fishing boats at anchor there as the night descended, tilting in the air. So the subject is the lights, right? The lights are tilting in the air. They're moving back and forth in the air. Why these lights mastered the night and portioned out the sea, so divided the sea. Fixing emblazoned zones and fiery poles, arranging, deepening, enchanting night. So in plain English, after listening to the woman's song and turning back toward town and looking at the fishing boats and the lights on the fishing boats as the night fell, because you have been changed by the music, because the woman's singing has given meaning to the natural imagery, now when you look at nature, you don't just see lights. You see the lights dividing the sea. You see different zones and different poles, and you see that these lights are arranging and deepening and enchanting the night. So if the sea added to the woman's song, the woman's song now adds to your enjoyment of the natural imagery. Back and forth, it's connected. It's dialectical. Oh, blessed rage for order, pale Ramon. So he's still talking to this guy. The maker's rage to order words of the sea. This is a Bible reference. Uh, the beginning of the Bible says, in the beginning there was the Word, the Word of God. And it is the Word of God that creates the universe. So here it says, the maker, God, rage, which means his urgent passion, to order words of the sea, to make order out of chaos to make something out of nothing, to make language out of the sea. Words of the frag uh, fragrant portals, dimly starred. Okay, so a portal is a door. In fact, this is talking about the stars in the sky, like each star is a different world, but it's describing it like it's somewhere we can actually go. So in fact, it's talking about the imagination, these fragrant, fragrant means it smells good, it's attractive. Um, so our rage for order, our need for order, gives meaning to the sea, gives meaning to the sky, and of ourselves and of our origins in ghostlier demarcations, keener sounds. Demarcation means division, like a boundary. And keen means uh, a clear sound. A keen sound is a clear sound. So because of this relationship between nature and our own language and thinking, we are able to find order or create order out of the sea, out of the sky, and out of ourselves and our origins. So the connection between nature and language gives us a better understanding of ourselves. That's not the right way to say this. The connection between nature and language gives us a way to understand ourselves. It's not a better understanding. It's a new understanding. It's a it's a created understanding. It's not something that is already there for you to find. It is something that we create. 
So just like 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, right? The way that you think determines how you see. Here, the way that you use language and thinking determines how you understand the natural imagery and how to understand your own position in the natural world. So why are there so many extensive and beautiful descriptions of the meaningless natural scenery? Because the poem is telling us that description, language, is what gives natural scenery meaning. The sea and the nature are meaningless until we use language to describe them, to admire them, to be inspired by them. And that's why there's so much beautiful language about this meaningless nature. It is performing what it says. It's talking the talk and it's also walking the walk. It's doing what it says. OK, so far, do you have questions? Those are the two main Wallace Stevens poems. Very deep and philosophical poetry. OK, let's move on to William Carlos Williams. Why is the red wheelbarrow so important? Most of you chose this question. Because it's I'm guessing because it's the shortest poem. This is the whole poem. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rain water beside the white chickens. So, so much depends. What? What depends on the red wheelbarrow? Well, first of all, from the spatial arrangement of the words on the page, we can say that the red wheelbarrow is supporting the first stanza. What is in the first stanza? So much. So, so much literally depends on a red wheelbarrow. You think don't use all. Literally, so much. So the red wheelbarrow literally so much. Right? So this is one way to understand this. It's talking about itself. But if we look at the colors, right? Red wheelbarrow, white chickens, white chickens. The scene is rainy. It's glazed with rainwater. It just rained. And yet the chickens are white. Shouldn't they be muddy? No, they're white. They're clean. Maybe they have been cleaned by the rain. They are clean and pure. They are pure and perfect and ideal chickens. And if we have perfect ideal chickens here, then next to it, we have the red wheelbarrow. It also suddenly seems perfect and ideal. It's red and glazed with rainwater. Glaze is the final layer that you put on pottery. Has a song yo. So usually when we think of rainwater, we think it's wet, it's going to get rusted, sunshio. But here it's glaze. The rain makes it perfect. The rain completes it. Red is actually the stereotypical color of a wheelbarrow. That's a dancing the so yense. So it's the ideal perfected version of the wheelbarrow because of this rain, because of these chickens. And so what depends on this red wheelbarrow? Uh, let me put it this way. Have you ever seen a color that is so pure, so clean, so attractive that you feel like you can get lost inside the color? No, you guys need to look at more art. Um, but this is the kind of color that the wheelbarrow has. 
it's not just red. It's a perfect red. It's an attractive red. It is the ideal of perfection in this dirty, rained out, muddy world. And the chickens are here to show you that it's not just the wheelbarrow. The wheelbarrow's perfection can influence and improve its surroundings. It turns the rain into glaze. It makes the chickens perfectly white. It is a very important ideal red wheelbarrow. And so not just so much, but everything good and kind and beautiful in this world depends upon the existence of this perfectly attractive red wheelbarrow. OK, so let's set color aside for the moment. Think about anything beautiful you have ever seen or ever heard. Beautiful imagery, sunset, nature, painting, beautiful person. How did that make you feel? Many people say that strong beauty makes you feel like you are dissolving the Ronghua, makes you feel like you are losing yourself into that beauty. Now imagine that this red is a beautiful red. This wheelbarrow in a specific angle at a specific time of day is a beautiful wheelbarrow. And you in, admire and in, enjoy this vision of a beautiful, perfect wheelbarrow. You take it in, you let it absorb you. And then you turn your head and you look at the chickens. Suddenly the chickens also seem beautiful. You look at the muddy ground. Suddenly the ground also seems beautiful. You have been infected by its beauty and the world has improved because you have found the beauty in this red wheelbarrow. Think about the last time you saw a really good movie. Like a perfect movie. You had the best time. It made you feel better. When you left the theater or when you stood up from your couch or whatever, and you looked around, suddenly the world seemed a bit different. Suddenly it seemed like anything was possible. Suddenly it seemed like the feelings that the movie gave you have changed you. It seems like you are full of energy and you can use this energy to do many great things. So what depends on this red wheelbarrow? If you understand it in this way, the red wheelbarrow is a symbol of art, the power of art. And the really genius thing about this poem is that it's just a fucking wheelbarrow. It's an ordinary, everyday, actually kind of ugly thing. Have you ever actually seen a beautiful wheelbarrow? No, but here the poem tells you even the ordinary everyday objects can be beautiful. And if you can see this beauty, you can see beauty everywhere. OK, now do you understand? OK, good. So that answers the question. Why is it so important? Because it's a symbol of the power of art. And if you don't have the ability to see something beautiful, then your life is a miserable and long ordeal. Next one, a sort of song. Is this about writing? Let the snake wait under his weed and the writing be of words slow and quick, sharp, to strike, quiet to wait, sleepless. I think this is pretty straightforward. The, the big, the major challenge is why is it talking about a snake? Like the writing, right? You want your words, if, when you need it to slow down, you want to have the words slow down. Sometimes you want the words to go faster. Sometimes you want the words to be sharp and powerful. Sometimes you want the words to quietly wait for the right moment, but always the words are sleepless. They are always ready. They are never unprepared. Like a snake. Like a dangerous snake waiting in the weeds. 
through metaphor to reconcile the people and the stones. How do you put people and stones together? Through metaphor, in yu, through language, through writing. No ideas but in things. So don't talk about love, talk about lovers. Don't talk about fame, talk about a famous person. Don't talk about suffering, talk about an actual situation full of suffering. No ideas but in things. Invent. Saxifrage is my flower that splits the rocks. A flower that splits the rocks. The soft, beautiful plant, powerful enough to split a rock into two. And that is the power of invention. That is the power of writing, right? It says compose, invent. Compose just means write. Yeah, the writing class is called English composition, right? Compose, writing. To compose is to invent. To invent is to break apart the world. And so you have to write about the world. No ideas, but in things. So is this about writing? Could be. First stanza is about how to. Manipulate your language. You have to use your language like a snake. The second stanza is about the power of language. What can this language do when you write? What effect can it have? And the answer is it can unite people and stones and it can also break apart rocks. That is the power of writing. OK, and then question five. We just saw Wallace D, uh, William Carlos Williams say there should be no ideas but in things. Wallace Stevens agreed with his idea. But do you think he agrees with this idea in a different way? In other words, when they both say no ideas but in things, are they actually doing different things? Are they writing in different ways? Well, we just talked about two poems from each person. Do you think that they use things and concrete imagery in the same way? Think. Oh, let's start from the easier one. Wallace, uh, William Carlos Williams. You have the red wheelbarrow. You have the snake that is a metaphor for writing. He starts with the concrete imagery and then he doesn't really explain why it is important, but he adds more concrete imagery. And in order to put all of it together and make it make sense, you have to add the symbolism. It comes from the reader. That's why I, I like talking about these poems. But think about Wallace Stevens. Woman singing by the sea, OK? But in the very first line, he says that her song is beyond the genius of the sea. The word genius is not a concrete word. It's a very abstract word. So from the very beginning of this po of the poem, the idea of order at Key West, it is not actually just about things. The poem is full of abstractions and uh, abstract language and like very philosophical language. So yes, the poem is about a woman singing. It does start from concrete imagery. But the way that it describes this imagery is already very abstract. Think about the Blackbird poem. Yes, every stanza is about the, the image of a Blackbird or the absence of a Blackbird. But like, look at the fourth stanza. A man and a woman, OK, concrete, are one. That's not very concrete. What does that mean? A man and a woman are one. Can you see that? Actually, no, don't don't see that. Um, a man and a woman and a blackbird are one. That's harder to see, very abstract. So yes, both poets focus on the things, but they describe the things in a very different way. Wallace Stevens tells you 
the philosophical direction that he wants you to go in. But William Carlos Williams doesn't. He just shows you all of the imagery and wants you to make sense of the images. So yes, both of them are talking about things, but they talk about things in a very different way. Number six, how do these poems fit into the interwar era? So let's look at page one of the handout. What do we have? Let's look at the modernism part. Psychoanalysis, dealing with the inside of the human mind. Close. I'd say it's very, it's not exactly the same, but it's very close. Like it's dealing with the human mind, not breaking it into three parts, but treating it as something that can be changed by the environment and that therefore can also turn around and change the environment again. So it's not just treating the mind as something there. It is actively part of the environment. Think about 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. So many stanzas are about the different parts of the mind, how a blackbird changes somebody's mind, how the blackbird scares somebody because he thinks it's a blackbird. So yes, there is a concern with the inside of the human mind. You only try to seek something that you have lost. If they have a tradition, they don't need to seek it. So seeking tradition makes sense. Uh, the poems ask us to put them together. The poems ask us to give it meaning. We no longer can look at a sonnet and say, oh, sonnet, 14 lines, it's about love. Now we have to say, what is the poem saying? How do we put it together? Where does the poem belong in the tradition of literature? So yes, these poems seek tradition. Um, engaging with popular culture, a little bit, not much. Like if you think of popular as applying to everybody and everyday life, then yeah, the wheelbarrow is everyday life. It's kind of uh, closer to the people, but it's not really popular culture. Aesthetic politics, if you understand politics to mean what you should do, then these poems are about trying to make you do things trying to make you think about something differently, trying to make you take the power of art and writing seriously. These poems are not just for you to enjoy. These poems are to try to change the way you think and change the way you act. Uh, and then we actually have one more poem we have not yet discussed that is closer to uh, the interwar era, in, especially in terms of the, uh, after the war and after the pandemic uh, with many people dying. So let's take a look at the widow's lament in springtime. This is page, page is this, five. Have you noticed every time we do five poems, I only ask you about four poems. Did you notice? I want to leave you a poem to enjoy by yourself. And uh, the fifth question will always be compare between the poems or compare between the two poets. And I'm hoping that maybe you will want to use the poem we did not discuss to answer that question. Because, you know, if I explain everything to you, how will you do the final exam? So the widow's lament in springtime. A lament is like a sorrowful complaint, I thought. Sorrow is my own yard where the new grass flames as it has flamed often before. 
So it's comparing her sorrow to her front yard where there grows flowers that burst alive during the spring. Just like before, just like every year. But not with the cold fire that closes round me this year. Right, because she's sad. So even the, the flowers, the beautiful flowers, no longer move her. These flowers are now a cold fire. 35 years I lived with my husband. Beautiful line. I love this line. Do you know why I love this line? Because it's so simple and yet so powerful. 35 years I lived with my husband in the past tense tells you that her husband is gone. The plum tree is white today with masses of flowers. Masses of flowers load the cherry branches and color some bushes yellow and some red. But the grief in my heart is stronger than they, for though they were my joy formerly in the past, today I notice them and turn away forgetting. So these beautiful flowers, and she describes these beautiful flowers, but she says, none of them are stronger than the grief in my heart. In the past, they made me happy, but today, as soon as I turn away, I have forgotten them. Today, my son told me that in the meadows, like a choling cao di sang, cao pi sang, at the edge of the heavy woods in the distance, he saw trees of white flowers. I feel that I would like to go there and fall into those flowers and sink into the marsh near them. A marsh is like a swamp. So in the beginning of the poem, these beautiful flowers are a symbol of her past joy. But today, the only way that flowers could comfort her is that they could mark a place for her to die. Oh. Such a beautiful poem. And this was written by, if I'm not mistaken, William Carlos Williams, the guy who focuses on imagery. Here, of course, it's not just imagery. You also have the voice of the widow. And this is what is able to make this poem so sad. As uh, Wallace Stevens told us, nature itself is meaningless. You have to have a human presence to give meaning to nature. So in uh, WCW's other poems, you have images and images. But here you have a person who helps show you the meaning of these images for her. She's a character, so she is also a concrete image in this poem. So in the end, we also once again have a relationship between images. So we had the red wheelbarrow and the white chickens. Here we have the beautiful flowers and the sad widow. Always concrete imagery interacting with each other inside the poem. I feel that I would like to go there and fall into those flowers and sink into the marsh near them. OK, that's today's lecture. Do you have questions? Do you have questions that you can put into language? OK, next week we're going to read one, two, three, Another five poems. We're going to read five poems by three different poets. The first one is very short, In a Station of the Metro. This is the whole poem. But as 
we saw today, a short poem is not necessarily a more simple poem. The second poem, The River Merchant's Wife, a letter, is by the same poet. These two were written by Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound is the most important poet in American literature who is also a bad poet. Today, most people agree his poetry is, generally speaking, not very good. But he's incredibly important for American literature because he had impeccable taste. When he saw a good poem, he knew exactly how good it was. And he was also a very talkative guy. So in American literary history, there are many important and wonderful great poets who only got published because Ezra Pound connected them with a publisher. Or Ezra Pound started a new literary magazine to publish all of his great writing friends. So Pound left his mark on literature, not just as a poet, he did write a few good poems, but also because of his direct influence on how people experienced poetry, what kind of poetry people experienced, and what kind of poets people started to read. Um, unfortunately, during World War II, Ezra Pound sided with the Italians. He was a fascist. Uh, and he was convicted by the US government for treason, Panguozui. But because he was such an important person in literature, all of his famous writer friends wrote letters to the government saying, oh, he's just confused. He's not really an enemy. He just doesn't know like what's right and what's wrong. So finally, they decided to move Ezra Pound from the jail to a psychiatric ward. And that's how he ended his life in a hospital. Poor guy. So the first poem is very short. The second poem is a translation. The original poem is in Chinese. This poem is Tsanggan But what's interesting about Pound's version is that he doesn't know Chinese. So how did he translate this poem without knowing Chinese? He worked with an expert in Japanese. And this Japanese expert, um, apparently, like uh, Li Po is also important in Japan. So this Japanese expert uh, understood this poem and wrote a basic translation for Pound. And then Ezra Pound kind of, uh, how do I say this? Kind of ignored the translation. He read the translation. He thought, oh, this is a pretty good poem. Let me improve it. And he like changed a lot of stuff and turned it into his own poem. That's basically what he did for his friends also, right? As an editor, his friends, uh, like a friend might send him a poem. He thinks, oh, this would be an excellent poem if you did this, did that, did that, and edited the poem for his friend. But it turns out he's a great editor, so people let him do this. Um, yeah, so I thought it would be interesting to see a Western person's understanding of this Chinese poem through the help of a Japanese expert. The third poem on page eight is also a famous poem, and it's famous for being not exactly hard to read and understand, but hard to remember. This is Poetry by Marianne Moore. Marianne Moore is famous for writing poems that are specifically hard to remember. Like, especially in high school English, your teachers will say, you know, let, memorize this poem or memorize this article. It's almost impossible to memorize this poem. And if you don't believe me, you can try. Everybody remembers the first four words. I too dislike it and then nobody remembers anything else. But the poem itself is also interesting. This poet is writing a poem called Poetry, and she begins the poem by saying, I too dislike it. 
Even I, a poet, don't like poetry. So you can go home and read to understand why she doesn't like poetry or maybe what kind of poetry she doesn't like. And then the last two poems are by E.E. E. Cummings. If you took my approaches to literature course in freshman year, we also read a poem by Cummings called Anyone Lived in a Pretty How Town. Up goes something very well down or something. The point is E.E. E. Cummings is one of those poets who likes to play with the space on the page. Look at this poem. Look at this poem. Look at it. It just looks like an E.E. E. Cummings poem. So I'm sure you can guess one of the questions next week will be about the shape of this poem. Why does it look like this? I'll tell you right away that this poem is about spring, right? In just spring, when the world is mud luscious, the little lame balloon man whistles far and wee. But it, there may be something hidden inside this poem. The key word is queer in line 11. The queer old balloonman. So there's something to think about as you read. And then the last poem will also be by E. Cummings. Pity this busy monster, man unkind. This turns out to be a very timely poem. It's not about mankind, it's about man unkind. How men are cruel, how men are unkind to each other. And I think the key here is line two. Progress is a comfortable disease. Yeah, so something fun for you to read. Questions? Okay, let's stop here. See you next week.